my name is Barbara Bierstein. I'm a member of the Santa Cruz County Arts Commission from the First District Live Oak. And I'd like to welcome you all to our annual Artist of the Year presentation tonight to honor Douglas McClellan. Um, I'd like to say that I think you probably all know and may have heard Robley Levy's remarks earlier this evening about why artists are so important to our community. Um, and I know you share with me the spirit that our artists here in this community really truly enrich and enliven our lives in so many different ways. Uh, and as you go through the county now and you begin to visit our parks throughout the area, you'll begin to see our Art in Public Places program that is bringing art, visual art, into our parks, which I hope you will all begin to visit the parks and, and see what we're doing there. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity also to introduce our previous Artists of the Year, who we're very proud of, and I'd like to ask you to stand as I call on you, please, so that we can welcome you all properly. Uh, George Barati. <laughs> Chuck Hilger. <laughs> the Cultural Council of Santa Cruz County, which is represented by Executive Director Lance Linares and President right. Jess Brown. The Cabrillo Music Festival, Ellen Premack is here on their behalf. <laughs> and I'd also like to mention a few others who I'm not sure I see in the room, but I'd like to call your attention to. Lou Harrison, who has also been an Artist of the Year, and um, Jim Houston, who we had hoped would both be able to attend tonight. And of course, there are many others. We've been doing this now for nine years, is it, Liz? We're all very proud of our artists who, I don't know whether or not you're all aware of the criteria for Artist of the Year, but what our commission tries to do is recognize an outstanding artist every year uh, who is not only a resident of our county, but also whose work has gained a national reputation and takes the name of Santa Cruz and also brings this individual to other people around our nation for the enjoyment of, of everyone throughout the country. And it also, the other third and very important criteria for our Arts of the Year is that they've made a contribution to Santa Cruz County and to our local community. And you'll be hearing more about how Douglas McClellan has been able to do that here in Santa Cruz, and we're very proud to recognize him this year. I'd like to now ask um, Sally Johnson if she would come forward from Sam Farr's office to make a presentation. Sally, are you here? There you are. And where's Doug? He is right here. There you are. We need Doug. <laughs> let's let's first off give you this. <laughs> Assemblyman Simfar wasn't able to be here at this moment because he had some other obligations, but he did tour your exhibit earlier today, and he deemed it brilliant. <laughs> in every every term <laughs> and he asked me to do some research to, to create the, some things for the resolution and there were a few things that didn't fit on the page so I thought I'd read them uh, <laughs> a friend and co-worker who's known Doug for some time and who has chosen to remain nameless <laughs> has characterized his friend as a model of sanity and intelligence and good thinking. <laughs> However, <laughs> he said, I can only think of two lapses. <laughs> the fiat he bought in Claremont. <laughs> And the first time he visited Rome, instead of wandering through the antiquities, instead he ended up in Mussolini's city. <laughs> Otherwise, he's sane and reliable. I'll never guess. <laughs> as we look at your exhibition, we're pleased to have you represent our county as Artist of the Year. Thank Congratulations. You so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Doug, you can't get away that quickly. <laughs> Please. Don't unschool me. Um, I'd now like to ask Marilyn Hansen to join us. There you are, Marilyn, on behalf of Senator Henry Mello. Well, I get to fill in the rest of the pieces of his wonderful life here on behalf of Senator Mello. Whereas Douglas McClellan has been selected by the Santa Cruz County Arts Commission as a 1992 Artist of the Year as a tribute to the valuable contributions that he has made to the art world and for the great pride and distinction he has brought to the local community. And whereas a visual artist who has exhibited widely in museums and galleries throughout the United States and abroad, Douglas McClellan obtained experience at Chaffee College in Ontario and the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles and at Scripps College and the Claremont Graduate School in Claremont. And whereas he moved to Santa Cruz in 1971 to become a, a member of the art faculty at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and taught classes in drawing, painting, assemblage, and visual fundamentals, he served as department chair from 1971 to 1974 and again in 1983. And whereas through his works, he has contributed to the enrichment of the arts community in Santa Cruz County by inspiring and encouraging young artists during a long academic career. Whereas in the early 1970s, he was involved locally with the Museum Without Walls, which produced the Revolutionary Broadsides, a collaborative effort of poets and visual artists. And whereas he was one of the five artists nationally to work on a Ford Foundation pilot study to develop a course for community group study of modern art. And he has served as a board member and active participant in several subcommittees of the Cultural Council and has been a member of several sub uh, of the Director's Advisory Committee of the Art Museum of Santa Cruz County. And whereas Douglas McClellan works at the edges of tradition in painting, collage, monoprint, and book arts. I wonder what that means. What's, what's the edges? <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> Whereas the contributions that Douglas McClellan has made to people throughout Santa Cruz County, the state of California, and the nation have been invaluable. And he has made a lasting impression on those individuals who have experienced his works. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate Rules Committee that Douglas McClellan be congratulated for being selected as 1992 Artist of the Year by the Santa Cruz County Arts Commission, commended for the significant contributions that he has made to the art world and for the great pride and dis distinction that he has brought to Santa Cruz County and extended best wishes for continued success in the future. This is a Senate Rules Committee resolution signed by David Roberti, Chairman, and Senator Henry J. Mello. Thank you very much. You've just been saved my autobiography. Of course, I'm very biased. I think we're saving one of the best pieces to last, which is the recognition of our own county, of you, Doug. So I'd like to ask uh, the chairman of our Board of Supervisors, Jan Butes, to please join us. Congratulations. Well, our resolutions are smaller, so only one person has to hold them, so I'll give it to you. <laughs> I'd like to really thank all of you for coming tonight. I was thinking as I was sitting up here that I've never seen this room so full of happy people. I mean, usually when the room is full, it's about something very controversial. Maybe some people are happy and some are sad. At least by the end, some are happy and some are sad. But it's really, I think, a tribute to Doug that he, all of you have come tonight to honor him on this very special night for him. I'd also like to, um, before talking about Doug for a minute, thank our um, Arts Commission because they are a very vocal and important part of our commission process here in the county and they really do a lot of work for us and we've got all kinds of new things going like art in the parks and, and art in our public places and whatever and I really appreciate the work certainly Barbara does for the first district and I know all the other supervisors do too and I just wanted to take a moment to say that. Art is certainly a very important part of, of life here in Santa Cruz, and, and Doug has been so involved in so many things, uh, the Art Museum and Cultural Council and, and so many other public um, 
issues that I think that that is really important. And I always notice, I came in today and I saw flowers here in the boardroom and I thought, wow, what a difference it makes. It's a small thing, but it looks so much better than it usually does. And it's the same with these walls. If you've ever been here when the exhibits are down, it's like 100% different than when the exhibits are here. And it, all of the artists in Santa Cruz County um, just add so much. And certainly to be named the artist of the year is to be um, very selective among a very um, select group of people. And in just looking at your art exhibit, it is so enjoyable. And our um, offices are here on the fifth floor. And the beautiful colors and certainly the differences of the <coughs> mediums. It, it, in reading the proclamation and then looking around, it, it really is very clear that you've got such varied styles. And, and I certainly enjoy the beautiful color, but I'd just like to thank you personally because since our offices are up here, we'll be able to enjoy your work for a very long time while it hangs. And so congratulations and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, it's now my turn to segue over to you, Doug, so that you can give us your perspective on your career and how you view art, and it's my pleasure to have had the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> I'm going to retreat back here. I have my remote control. I can control my environment. <laughs> thank you all for your generosity. Uh, my wife thinks you've done too much already. <laughs> and I want to take advantage of the generosity and encouragement that you've all given by subjecting you to a personal account of my life as an artist. It's an autobiographical sketch that might turn out to be like the third grade book report. This book tells a great deal more about dogs than I'm interested in knowing. <laughs> But it's just a few pages, a couple of dozen slides, 35, 40 minutes tops, <laughs> to promise. I was born in Southern California, and if you want to know what that looked like then, all you have to do is rent some old Laurel and Hardy movies. We had bungalows, we had avenues. We also had ice cream parlors that looked like ladies in hoop skirts. We had orange juice stands appropriately shaped like an orange. When I was in high school, we bought our sandwiches from a place shaped like a weenie on a bun. <laughs> when I graduated from junior high school, we had a yearbook. Uh, that, we were in very progressive education time, so we had a yearbook in junior high school. It was a simple thing. It had photographs of the school, photographs of the faculty, and of the students. And underneath each of our pictures, we rated a legacy. Things like Devil with the Women, or Clothes Horse, or Mr. Football. Mine was Dirty Fingernails. <laughs> and this is the absolute truth. It's the only time I think it was ever used as a, as a, a legacy in a uh, yearbook. <laughs> All my remembered life I've drawn, but not compulsively. I was a rather sickly kid, and I never learned to roller skate, so I had a lot of time to read and a lot of time to draw and a lot of time to make up codes. At 13, I sent away for a Billy Hahn cartoon by mail course. And the first lesson of the first page of the first lesson said, you must cover acres of paper with gallons of ink. The sooner you make your first 1,000 mistakes, the sooner you'll be over them. And I immediately discontinued the course. <laughs> I got a D in my first art class, which was in watercolor, and I've never trusted the medium since. <laughs> I eventually went to art school against parental wishes, so industrial design seemed a good solution. It was a compromise between my innate desire to get my fingernails dirty and some deep need I had to be, deep middle class need I had to conform. Luckily, the Walt Disney Studios were on strike, and one of the men from the studio had opened an art store across the street from school. And he saw me as a rudderless young man who was woefully on the wrong path. So he uh, started to instruct me. He, was, he became my pusher. 
and he sold me on modern art. He would give me illustrations, books to read, tell me about it, tell me what a rotten thing uh, industrial design was really, and uh, he, he totally subverted me. Uh, Pearl Harbor came, we were eligible, and we studied camouflage. And so we finally went into the service, fearless camoufleurs. You, you name it, we'll hide it. <laughs> Eventually we went overseas and didn't do any camouflage. And so while I was overseas not doing camouflage, I started up the career ladder of command. At some point I discovered the joys of insubordination. I was reduced in rank for the good of the service, <laughs> busted, and on the day it became official, a package arrived from home. I had sent for some oil paints, the, an anthology of modern poetry, and Sheldon Cheney's book on modern art. And there they arrived, that very day I became a free man, as it were. This great epiphany took place in the Philippines right there on the floor of the jungle. The oil paints were great. They allowed you to make mistakes. Unlike that devilish medium watercolor, which demands a certain amount of dexterity, being ambidextrous, I didn't have the other kind of dexterity. The wonderful world of abstract art was not obligated to the tedium of copying, which is a really bad misapprehension I had about what, art, what drawing was about. And the modern poetry was great, and I realized you didn't even have to use capital letters if you didn't want to. So with this great package of freedom arriving, I never looked back. That was where I wanted to be, and that's what I became. For the next five years, I'd gone to art school on the GI Bill, supplemented by making scale models for Smokey the Bear for the LA City Schools. Don't burn Smokey's habitat. This was the motto over the models I made. By the time I'd learned about, by that time I'd learned about art to this extent. Drawing is important. Paint, oil of course, is a wonderful material. It's a form of religion. Composition is the key to any puzzle, but social message is also important. One of my most influential teachers took me aside once and confided in me that I could be the person to paint the next George Washington crossing the Delaware. <laughs> I've puzzled over that for years. <laughs> I'd also collected my own pantheon of artists, artistic mentors from art books and from museums and things I'd looked at. I'd wisely married the woman who took role in school and conveniently I received an MFA degree. Now at some point, some precise point near adulthood, we become printed with certain precepts that stick through, at least try to stick through us through life. We become grounded. And my grounding was your basic modern, conventional modern, say, grounding. A little expressionism, a little abstraction, very sincere but slightly tasteful, a neoconservative rebel, if you will. And of course, we all learn from reading about Van Gogh that we're all going to be sadly misunderstood throughout our lives. Cezanne had cast his long shadow on nearly everyone at the time, and I was imbued with the standard urge to create form. It's a near cosmic substance that no one really could get around to defining, but it was there. And even so, I was suspicious of all that wild stuff coming out of New York in the early 50s but I was at the same time fascinated with the freedom that it represented. On getting out of grad school in 1950, I had, because of accidents of the times, a family, me, Ozzy, you, Harriet, <laughs> a job waiting, a gallery affiliation in Los Angeles, which was becoming an art place. Uh, I, was, I had a, a fairly good track record as an exhibiting and sometimes prize-winning painter. The job, as it turned out, wound up being a teacher of five classes plus night class. And in addition to that, I was chairman of a growing department. And so this twist of fate that managed to keep me chairmaning for the next 25 years, I meant, it meant, among other things, that for nine months of the year, I had to use the left side of my brain being terribly adult. And then for three months, I could try to use my right side and become an intuitive creature, which wasn't always that easy to pull off. And it led to a certain scatteredness of activity that still hangs around me. 
I think any history made of my, work, my life as an artist would have to be a series of short stories and not a novel. It's a series of discrete things that happen. For a number of years, I made and exhibited paintings, and I had an affair of the heart with color and surface, and it was wonderful. Okay, so for those of you who are taking notes, these are significant <laughs> things to remember. Dirty fingernails, mail order cartooning, orange shaped orange juice stands, Walt Disney's labor policies, insubordination in the U.S. mails, George Washington crossing the Delaware, and Smokey the Bear. <laughs> of such stuff are dreams made, huh? <laughs> After a while, in the early 60s, I began to have some slight ruptures of faith. My undying commitment to painting developed some glitches. Form, as I courted it, uh, didn't seem to be an end all. Mastery of paint, oil paint, of course. Still had its kitchen pleasures, but it didn't seem as cosmically central to the world as it had. Certain interests and curiosities I'd put on the back burner as not being serious art making began to insist on attention. Collage, that terribly flexible, non-linear, art schoolish, mildly illicit, uh, fun form of playing around with images began to appear much more legitimate. And it was flexible and it had a lot of adventure to it. And these were qualities I didn't find in good old drawing and painting. I'd seen too many colleagues who were still plugging away, making artifacts they hoped looked like art, uh, not, and, and kind of joyless activity. And I thought that that was not a great fate to have. So these alternate approaches allowed for an attitude of play and allowed for a collision of formal elements and subject matter that was quite zesty. I used cut and paste in school, found it useful, but uh, it was never for real, never, never, never art. And also for several years I'd been doing vacation stuff, putting flotsam and jetsam together at a beach house we rented. It was great stuff for the mantle or for house gifts or stuff like that, but it didn't have a capital A attached to it, so it wasn't really art yet, even though it went by a, a rather nifty name of assemblage. I couldn't quite elevate it. But it was totally absorbing and I found really very creative. So this taste of openness along with some unscratched issues having to do with subject matter, having to do with words, actually poetry had been a thing I'd done rather seriously in the army for various reasons. Uh, I didn't draw much. Uh, not to mention some fascination with some really funky old technical things I'd learned doing Smokey the Bear. Little glues I discovered and the use of goat hair and things that nobody else did. And, and there was so much fun to use, but I couldn't find a, a legitimate avenue. But I sensed that there was a way I could use these things. So, so much for my grounding as a dedicated painter. I'd started dropping ballast and trying to move into something else more easily. But the generation that I sprang from had difficulty being able to play, I think. Maybe more than most. After all, we were participants in the Great Depression, World War II. We were Ozzie and Harriet. We were the spearheads of unparalleled progress lighted by GE. Uh, to allow oneself to play was a denial of your own, very own grounding. It was even, God forbid, an insult to the spirit of Vincent Van Gogh who suffered for our sins. And perhaps the best influences an artist can have are not the, uh, the lifters, the uh, inspirational artists, but the ones that give him permission to do something else. And I had been interested in a lot of artists who were, I'd say, pretty informal artists, uh, artists that did junk sculpture, artists that did collage. And I would have considered them a minor artist. And then it occurred to me, by a very simple twist, I could make them into major artists and therefore I had my permission. So I went through a sea change and more or less that is where things began to happen. I think I'd like to go with some slides now. And uh, we, are not, we are not lighted yet. Some of these early slides are in terrible shape they're not level. You are not, you are not losing your bearings. Um, this, this goes back to 53. Is that in focus? I can't really tell from here. And it probably represents pretty much uh, what I was doing when I was first out of school. I was fascinated with color. I was fascinated with uh, 
playing with shapes, playing with, with the, the, you know, the basic building blocks of, blocks of painting. Uh, still life as uh, an interest, but a much greater interest in landscape. And I had to sort of re recapitulate uh, the whole process of making a landscape. It's like the dissertation on a roast pig. I had to burn down the village to get a roast pig. I'd start with a very literal landscape and then painstakingly hack it to pieces. Uh, this is a painting of a quarry near our house, so the, uh, the, the sense of, of the ground dropping out from under you is what I was after. There was smog in that area even at that time, and you sense it in the painting. But you can see, you can see I think, a, a fascination with color. Another one of that time, in a very amateur slide. The, <laughs> the magnificent center of interest here is not a part of the painting. <laughs> Somewhere in the mid-70s, that got on the slide, and I don't know <laughs> what to say about it. But the, the need to get more concrete, I think, is what uh, sets in here. And also the need to, to, to say something about things. And this, to me, was, a, was kind of a watershed painting. It was called The Object and Landscape. And it came at the time when they were first uh, working with rockets. And, and there, were, there were pictures in the paper, there were pictures in the, on television of the large gantries and the rockets. And to me, the, the analogy between that object and the uh, medieval cathedral being the center of the community struck me as being very similar the object that soaks up all of the energy around it. And I, I punished this painting and ruined it eight times and I don't think I ever saved it. But it was important in that I got away from uh, certain visual habits and into a much more tactile sort of paint. And by this time then I'm using uh, sand in the paint and light aggregates, building the, building the blocks, uh, a figure from again from a uh, from a Romanesque uh, church, and then a jump to even more of an object-oriented painting, where parts of these shapes are cut out. I think the date on this would probably be about 1962. Just to, I mean, we're just doing a quick run here. But when I'd go to the beach, I wouldn't do paintings. I would make things. And here on our porch is a chair I made, uh, painted, decorated. Uh, not legitimate, not art, nothing like that, just I did it. Or I'd find wood on the beach, and we had a particularly rich beach, a lot of stuff that had been on boats washed ashore, was tumbled in the sand, and had uh, an old washboard came ashore, so making these, these tablets became really fascinating. And the thing I found is that by taking something that already had a previous existence, something that had lived and, and been batted around, I could borrow that energy and work it into a whole new sort of life. Uh, I carried it back inland and had the good fortune of spending, having a studio for two years next door to a furniture maker who made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Can't beat it. So I began to work in walnut, you see. <laughs> As he got better, I had to switch. <laughs> but every so often, there was a, a, a desire to get back to just pushing paint. And I, I've never lost it. So I worked out a series of paintings on the tiger. This is Blake's Tiger Updated. And I even rewrote the poem uh, I can't remember the first few lines. Tiger, tiger, burning mild. Oh, to think you once were wild. And it, it's the organization Tiger. Uh, the owner of that painting might even be in this room now. I don't know. He is. He is. <laughs> How's it holding up? Still inspiring you? Yes. Okay. And uh, because of my academic life, a uh, committee of tigers. And I, I didn't really try to do anything. Uh, other than just be slick and representational and use paint uh, in, in as, as natural a way as I could. Now, I told you that, that the course of things is more like a series of stories rather than a novel. It's not each discrete 
summer, each discrete vacation from adulthood, you might say, uh, might have produced a different thing. The, the next things are a few of those, those episodes. Uh, along the way, I, I built a drawing machine. I thought I needed some pattern and I didn't want to draw it myself. I thought I can make a machine that will make nice patterns and I can use those in collage or I can use those in something else. And I got a barbecue motor and I got some piano wire and some fish weights and some pens and I made this mobile that went around and I could trick it into jumping like a water bug and not repeat itself too much. The one thing I miscalculated on was that it was so fascinating to watch, I'd say, okay, I'm going to leave it, I'm going to go over here and do something useful, and in two minutes I'd be back watching the machine go through its traces. So uh, it generated a bunch of drawings, but it, it, was, uh, it was a failure as a time-saving device. <laughs> uh, when we were in Rome, uh, what better thing to do than uh, get some bronze casting done? and something I could do in an apartment, so I made some waxes and had them cast. Uh, th this is a series of, of plaques that I did there that were based on an item that I read about. I've always been fascinated with the Etruscans. They, they were great believers in the horuspex, the person that reads the, the omens, that reads the signs of the future. And in order to train young Etruscans to, to be good liver readers, they made up models of livers in bronze, a training liver, so that the teacher could say, okay, when this happens, you know, there's going to be a pestilence, and when this happens, you're going to have good crops, and so on. And I thought, what a great idea. You know, a training liver, or a training anything, made in bronze. And so I made a series of training livers. Uh, <laughs> uh, along the way, I got a commission to do a stained glass window, and I thought at one time I was going to quit everything and become a stained glass artist. I didn't, do, I didn't do the honest work on it, I just did the design though. I didn't cut the glass and let it. Uh, this is for a library at, at Scripps College in Claremont. And it's, it's, a, uh, it's a development of alphabet, the alphabet idea going from the, from the base, which you cannot see here, up to the Roman alphabet, triumphant above all. Uh, how's that for chauvinism? Uh, it was radical to the man that made it because we left some clear glass in it and he said that should never be done. But they did want views. It, it runs two stories in a mezzanine and it was important to be able to see outside. I also have had a fascination with trying to get words and images together. And uh, for the life of me, I can't figure out yet how to do it. I did a series of, of uh, haiku, this being one, and I decided to make a painting out of a haiku and then I could never figure out what I was more loyal to, the, the poem or the image. And it would kind of go back and forth. And I wound up with things that I thought were rather cosmetic and not very interesting. But I'm showing you here a sampler of, mostly of failures. To show you that even though I'm modest of the year, I'm modest, right? <laughs> to talk a little more about collage, it's, it's more than a technique. It's an attitude. And it's an approach that's really rather all consum uh, consuming. It's, uh, the jamming together of disparate images. It's, it can be the fluid filmic idea of montage. It can be sampling in, in new music. It can be the visual metaphor for the passage of time, which is a visual artist always seems to have a little bit of trouble with. It, uh, it can be a gate to unconscious processes because it is so flexible, it is so fast, it is so surprising. And it's probably truer to the mosaic way we see things in the world then your, uh, honest to God, middle distance painting uh, of reality suitable for framing. It, it does have a truth to it that other, other pictorial means do not have. But I think most important, it has that playful dimension. It's free form. It has something to do with magic. And to me, it turned out to be sort of like catnip. <laughs> now, play demands an open attitude, and, and it can be awfully trivial when there's nothing at stake. And at some point, there have to be limits. When I stopped chairmaning, I had more time, more attention. I could be reasonably silly 
for longer periods of time. I started making collages out of some very tricky materials that I discovered. Now, I talked about grounding earlier on. There are three things I learned engraved on my heart in art school. It's never, symmetry is dumb. Bilateral symmetry is dumb. It is not composition. Uh, illusionism is a cheap shot. We must go for eternal verities and not illusionism. And a tricky technique masks an empty soul. <laughs> so, I said, so I suddenly found myself doing things that were <laughs> doing things that were intensely symmetrical, uh, <laughs> highly illusionistic, and uh, tricky beyond belief. Uh, I, I'd forgotten how mysterious these are to people until I put some up at the Art League in the show I had a little while back. And uh, people were really fascinated with how they were done. I'd, I'd sort of lost sight of them. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how they were done, but <laughs> people were fascinated. Uh, I could do the mountains behind, behind the Mona Lisa. You know, I could do that. I could just gorge myself on all those forbidden goodies that I had never been, uh, I've never allowed myself to approach before. This one is titled Four Absent Angels. And this is Voice for Madness. And this one I realized long after I did it is very influenced by the Jasper Johns painting of the target with the four four items in the boxes above. And one that stood over Lance's desk for a while, uh, Space Comics, where I'd been doing things that, that flirted with the same idea of the idea that was common to uh, comic strips. And I thought, oh, what the hell. Let's do a comic strip. So I put balloons in and did the whole, the whole number. Now this probably this isn't collage in the, in the strictest sense because in collage in the strictest sense you take something that has a previous uh, existence like a playbill or a piece of newspaper or a ticket or a, a tear of a photograph. These are all papers that I made from scratch. So it's only collage in that these things are pasted together. The, the, the decoupage aspect of collage is what really happens here. But this idea of limits uh, I, I would make rules in order to not lapse over into something that was too trivial. Um, in, in some of the collages, I used a deck of cards to determine what happened when. Uh, in some of the later works, I decided that I would limit myself to five objects in the cage. You'll see some out in the, in the case. Uh, at some point, I allowed myself to cheat, but until I could get past the sensor that sat on my shoulder. You know, we all have a sensor on our shoulder that tells us things we'd rather not hear. And uh, it can inhibit you tremendously. So it keeps you from getting too down to cases. And if you can convince the sensor on your shoulder, mine, mine's male, him, convince him to go along with the rules as you're making them up, you can get into the middle of things, and then you can begin to, to thresh around and really get something done. So uh, I made rules. <laughs> when I stopped chairmaning, I didn't miss my I didn't miss it a bit. My time became my own and I was able to concentrate. I think the only downside is that I had fewer outside factors to blame. Uh, for not working. And of course then when I retired I had even fewer things to blame. And I can now play it working my, to my heart's content even when I don't feel like it. <laughs> as, as a carryover from this art as a summer activity, I, I work basically in series uh, from five to maybe 30 pieces. And uh, I find that by working a, a series of things more or less at the same time, you get a dialogue going between pieces. The poet uh, Tom, Tony Connor said the recipe for writing a good poem was invent a jungle then explore it. And I think that describes it pretty well. With several works going at the same time 
you have a lot of paths to explore that you can explore an idea fully. So in sitting down to do something, this began a series of uh, works with rubber stamps and prints. And uh, I must honestly admit watercolor. <laughs> I started collecting rubber stamps and having them made and have an unholy collection of them now, which you will see the images of on the piece out in the hall and sporting around town on various buses. Um, but combining them with uh, airbrush, watercolor, colored pencil, whatever, to create these kind of Persian miniature uh, things of absurdities. And rubber stamp is very much like collage because instead of cutting and pasting, you really stamp something there, and you stamp it there, and you mask it out, you stamp it there. This is uh, one, one of the series of exploration of the Wurlitzer effect. <laughs> And the Xerox is a, is a friend indeed, too. Here's a one-of-a-kind piece that uh, is in a local collection with Xeroxes of a uh, karate or Tai Chi uh, postures. And another attempt at words, and here are the rubber stamp images with the book, this very precious book of which there are only 11 copies. This book of specious advice done on the best of paper using the most difficult of techniques, hand colored, hand pulled, hand bound, hand everything, uh, from a gassy old windbag called Uncle Bob. And it was primarily in the writing here that the thing became uh, important. For the exhibition here, uh, the works are done fairly recently, and they represent polar opposites, I think. They're done within two years of each other. And the monotypes, which we can see from here and there in the halls, they really represent this return to the joys of painting, even though they are done as monotype collages. The, the, the issues are those of painting. I, I would start with a, uh, a piece of good paper and print on it, and then would print various patterns on, on oriental paper that's very easy to glue down and begin to just play with shapes. And it was really a very lifting thing to do. It was very, very light, very enjoyable thing to do. The cages uh, are almost anorexic in comparison. I limited myself to five objects in a little cage, right? Think of the implications of that. Uh, very little color. The cage is black. They are trapped in there. Or virtually trapped in there. And they're either stage sets for the mind or they're uh, shamanistic rituals or whatever they might be. Uh, they came after the earthquake, and I don't know what the earthquake had to do with, really. I'm not sure that it had a great deal to do with it. But uh, I was in one of those terrible periods where nothing was, no ideas were coming. And suddenly there they were. And. Uh, I worked them up, and I did dozens of them. And then suddenly, they stopped being. There's no more need for them. So here, I think I've just left out a very significant part of my life. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Scroll back. <laughs> quickly. <laughs> uh, at another point in my life when I couldn't figure out what to do, I suddenly decided I would make set pieces. And this was one of the first threshes at it. The, um, the frame is actually the top of a Singer sewing machine cabinet, you know, the old kind of the machine would lift up and set into this. And uh, I was casting around for something that would work. And then it occurred to me that if I made 18, bo 18 boxes with peaked roofs on them and said, okay, wise guy, what are you going to do? That something would have to happen because I'm too scotched to make all this stuff and then not use it. <laughs> it was a lot of trouble. I had to learn it. So I did a whole series of, of house forms that are about three and a half inches deep 
uh, there, there's a glass front. Uh, this one happens to be at Farewell to LA. The jigsaw is a map of the LA freeway. And the, uh, it's hard to read here, but this is a rear view mirror with a yellow stripe down at the highway stripe. And uh, I thought that was a great idea. Um, the ideas began to come out of the material. By, that, by this point, I really trusted the material enough that I didn't really want to impose ideas on it. For the most part, I thought, okay, I'll start, and it's going to tell me something. I wanted to exercise the ghost of Saul. So I got a version of Cezanne, and then I faked it up as a painting. I got some stuff from a craft store that looks like, that they put on, on reproductions that look like paint strokes. So I made strokes and I put a frame on it. And I took a picture and stenciled 